Hey up and welcome to the Strategy Sessions. My name's Andy Jarvis. I'm the host of the show and the Strategy Director at Eximo Marketing. Thanks for coming along. This is episode seven, season three, and more importantly, Happy New Year to you. It's the first episode of 2023. If you're listening in three, four years time, you'd be like, so what? Who cares? But if you listen as they come out, yeah, well, hey, Happy New Year to you. I uh, hope you had a lovely Christmas and we're going to come back after Christmas with an episode which talks to someone in a similar sector to the last episode before Christmas. So pre-Christmas, I had Ian and Sinead on from Evolved in Newcastle talking about how they build an award-winning culture, the people that drive the performance in their agency, how they've gone from two to 60 in a really short space of time. We also talk a little bit about the partnership that Exmo and Evolved have, so go back and check that episode out. Today, my guest is Naomi Almawi from Viaduct Generation, a um, bit of a smaller agency, but still brilliant people work there. And we talk a little bit about uh, Naomi's career and focusing on some of the areas in marketing that a lot of people can get wrong, things like demand generation, lead generation, working with sales teams and events and things like that. Um, try as you might, and I do try really hard. Uh, I do really want to hate Noemi. Uh, she works for VG based in London and they're a lovely bunch of people. And she lives in Barcelona most of the time. And he just like, you really, really want to hate her. Um, but I've tried for a little while and I can't. Well, I'm doing my best to, but I really can't. Um, but in terms of what you can learn, what you can take away from this, it's definitely worth sticking around and hearing uh, Naomi's take on a number of issues, but especially those around what people get wrong in events and demand generation, working with sales teams, that type of thing. Enough of me waffling. Let's just listen to Naomi talk about her career and where we go next. So thanks for listening. And don't forget, if you are on Spotify, leave us a little five star review. And if you hate the show, well, don't leave a one star review. But Say why as well, you know, leave a little bit of text so I can find out what it is you like or dislike, as the case may be. Anyway, here we go. On with the episode. So my guest today on the strategy sessions is Noemi Elmawe. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I am top of the world and always happy to have you on the podcast. Um, so we've been on the other end of this before, haven't we? I've, yeah. I've been on your podcast. So now this is some sort of inception podcasty thing going on, right? We do, we're doing a bit of a swap seat. <laughs> So, but the good thing about that is that um, I don't do as much talking this time. You have to answer all the questions and I get to be the awful shit who does the interrogation. So first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do? Where do you work? Why are you, why are you here on the show? Sure. Oh, while I'm here on the show, you might have to answer that one. But um, so I'm head of marketing at an SEO agency called Viaduct Generation. We're, we're a new kind of startup when you're on the scene. Um, I think what di differentiates us is that we're, we're mission led. So we're all about supporting underrepresented founders kind of get their websites ranking. Um, and yeah, and I've, I've been in this position for officially since April this year. So 2022, um, but was working part time for about a year before I joined on a full time basis. Gotcha. And so how did you get into marketing then? You've been couple of different jobs that got you to where you are now so tell mm -hmm. us through that that history and that progression sure um I mean I guess I kind of have to start at uni so I start I studied Spanish and management at uni Spanish was kind of like my passion subject I knew that I wanted to go to South America specifically um and management was really the subject that I chose because I had no idea what I wanted to do at all I had some idea that I wanted to kind of go into corporate um but I didn't know what that looked like so management was one of the, those subjects that touched on a bit of everything um and I did um, I had a marketing module which incidentally I hated <laughs> I was like I came out of uni so sure I was not going to go into marketing I think how's that worked that out for you <laughs> really well apparently um but I think I unluckily had a professor who was kind of the worst of the stereotypes of marketers where it's just a lot of bullshit it's a lot of like window dressing very opaque like like let's fool people into buying our product and stuff and I don't think it was a very good vision or visual of what 
marketing really is about. Um, if if you're only listening, you're not watching pain. the video, you've not seen the face I've just pulled as a little <laughs> part of my soul died inside when you said that. Um, yeah. Off air later on, you can tell me the name of this person and I'm going to go Liam Neeson on them. I'm going to find you and I'm going to kill you. Uh, so yeah, so if you, um, Liam Neeson doesn't sound like that, by the way. But if you, yeah, let me know who that is because that's just, I, I hate that shit. It was I'm painful. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, especially now that I am in it, I realised that it was just, it's so much more than that. Um, but yeah, I came out of uni kind of not really focused on marketing at all. And then I moved to Barcelona, which is where I live now. Um, and I was just trying to find myself a job. I was really applying to everything and anything. And I saw this internship at a fintech company um, where it was it was within the marketing team, but it was almost like a journalism role. It was to do it was to do interviews with CEOs. It was essentially an inbound marketing technique, technique really, um, about kind of contacting CEOs outside of being a salesperson to try and you know get them to understand what the company was about, talk about the topic. Um, and so I joined that team. Um, it was kind of like a late stage startup at that time. That was in 2018. Um, and then it was it was a pretty small internal marketing team, and I really got to really shape, I guess, my marketing career in that in that team. I moved into events after, so I did that kind of six month internship. Um, managed to stay. Um, saw there was a huge gap in the events process. It was a B two B fintech as well, worth noting. And so I I noticed that they were sending salespeople to trade events and conferences. But there wasn't really either like a tracking system or a way to see if how successful these conferences were. It was just a bit, it was kind of the salespeople being like, oh, I've got a prospect going to this event. I'm just going to attend with no data behind it at all. And so I love organization. And so I saw an opportunity to create a bit of a process to organize it a little bit and start documenting what we were doing, how successful these events were. Um, and it really kind of went from there. I, I stuck in events for about two, three years, dabbled in like comms, internal comms as well. Um, and then, yeah, and then it led me to what I'm doing with BG now. Okay, right. I'm going to roll back and pick bits of this out as we go yeah, along. Yeah, that was so, a big answer. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it was a big answer. and Probably not one that's going to clip up really easily for the promo. So let's see if mm. we can make some clippable <laughs> answers from this. But no, so when we you started talking about... Um, I'm going to come back to talking about uni later on, just once I've calmed mm -hmm. down and my annoyance has gone. But yep, that first job where you were interviewing CEOs and using it as a, a lead generation approach, right? Yeah. There's lots of different names for that. Um, if you're a regular podcast listener, you will have stumbled across many, many marketing podcasts where the marketing agency goes out and talks to so many CEOs and spends the whole time telling them just how wonderful they are, right? And it's the same yeah. thing. Get some face time with them. Some people call it account-based marketing. Some may call it lead generation. Exactly. There's lots of different terms for it, right? Um, have you seen it be successful? That's my first question. Uh, very good question. It was successful to an extent, but it wasn't as successful as cold calling, for example. So actually about three months into this internship, they actually put an end <laughs> to this internal magazine that I was a part of. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to quite quickly make myself useful. It was successful in the sense of we were really going for those prospects that were impossible to reach via mm -hmm. cold calling. Like there were just too many people in the yeah. way. And we kind of came, because we came in with a PR angle rather than we want to talk to you about this pain point in your company. Yeah. It was a lot more successful in that, in that sense, but it wasn't as quick and it took a lot of resources to yeah. get to that point. So you're in a B2B startup and yeah. then, so their, their measure of success is um, basically leads coming into the system, right? And exactly. then converting into sales. So cold calling, you know, is just a funnel approach. If you make a thousand calls, you'll get 200 answered. If you get 200 answered, you'll get uh, 50 people spoken to. If you speak to 50, you'll get 10 appointments. If you get 10 appointments, you'll get two sales. Brilliant. Exactly. Just repeat that every week, right? And we'll mm -hmm. end up with 52 sales, whatever. So you were, your activity was being deemed a success or a failure 
on the same sort of metrics as cold calling. But what I think you're saying is that it was a bit more upper funnel stuff. It was longer term, just getting you on the radar, first of all. Yeah, 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 exactly. So we did, I do know that we did get some clients out of it. Um, And it was a situation that actually, if CEOs were quite open to it, because we were talking directly to the CEO, Things Sorry, talking move directly to their ego. That's the that's the big yes, thing. yes, maybe most importantly, but yeah, because we were talking essentially with the main KDM that there's no one really bigger than the CEO within that company. If they want something to happen, then it will. Um, and they mm. will push for things to happen and things will happen a lot quicker compared to when you do take the cold call approach, you're working your way up through the system, right? And then the ultimate sign-off is maybe a CEO. And so we were kind of working the other way around. So maybe we weren't as successful from the point of view of the CEOs kind of saying yes, but when they did, we did see a shorter sales cycle as well. Yeah. yeah. And and it's amazing when you start talking about measurement of activity, how quickly, certainly in, well, in every world, but definitely in B2B world, how mm. quickly things are measured on leads into the funnel and suspects becoming yes. prospects and prospects becoming clients and, and all those that sort of stuff. Um, We had someone on, oh, maybe season two. I can't remember. We talked about they don't put metrics on their brand work, B2B SaaS products, mm. because it's, a, it's just too long term. It's too long scale. We just do it because we know it's the right thing. That Absolutely. seems like a ballsy decision, but it does feel like it needs to be measured differently, I think is the point I'm trying to make. For sure. And I think also one of the elements, because we were essentially, we were producing content and it was actually quite high value content for what it was. We were, we were marketing for a product that didn't exist. We were creating um, a kind of a demand for it. And so a huge part of our responsibility was to kind of get the messaging out there and to also get people to understand that this was a problem that existed within their companies and so if you've got a ceo talking about it straight away kind of from a pr value from a content value that that kind of bumps up and that is obviously a lot harder to measure you know thought leadership all of that stuff you can't put real real numbers to it but if you do say hey we've list- we've spoken to 10 ceos who agree that this is a problem within their company much more likely ceo number 11 is going to be a lot more open minded to what we're saying compared to maybe number 1 who maybe was a bit more difficult to approach in the first place i think the other thing as well is that that content has such a lifespan as well is that you can Absolutely. every one of those interviews is is something you can use the whole amalgamation of 10 CEOs, you know, oh, well, now we've got a white paper or we've got some sort of report mm. we can push out. And exactly. then all of this can keep coming over and over and over and over. And the, the lifespan of that, the payoff time is, is measured in years, not we're not cold calling, yeah. answer, don't answer. Yeah, and, uh, and then it goes through the process and comes out the other side pretty quick. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned the reports, actually, because that's exactly what we did. We, we tried to go by industry we were quite specific on the industries that we really wanted to tackle and so then yeah after a while and we had enough CEOs from a certain industry talking about the topic we were able to put a report together without again needing the consulting side or the approval because all of these quotes had previously been used we were essentially repurposing our own material Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you've got it right, you might as well use it. Like I said, it can be expensive to invest in that type of content Mm. approach. So you might as well make the best use of it. For sure. For Um, sure. But they obviously didn't believe in this um, to their own detriment. So, but but this is the start of the world, right? (laughs) Um, So they they binned you and you had to find your own way into another one of my favorite B2B tools, which is events. Mm hmm. Let's talk about events. Um, When you're talking about events, are you talking trade shows and that type of event? Yeah, yeah. So industry events, mainly, um, less so conferences, actually, I did mention conferences, but really, we're really talking about events where you've got stands, people are trading, people are open minded to like a salesperson coming up and having a conversation with them. Now, on a scale of one to 10, how shit would you say most companies are at doing trade shows? Shit or very shit? <laughs> extremely is that is that one that i can include yeah um like the worst shit possible yeah yeah i do you know what for me it's a really interesting one because i felt 
I didn't have a huge amount of experience, right, when I went into events. A lot of what I did was applying a certain logic. And because I had the time, I was able to become that resource internally. And so I didn't think it was as valuable as as it was until I really spoke to people outside. And then I would kind of give something that I thought was obvious. And they would then be like, wow, that's so insightful. Like We've never thought of doing it in this way. And I just, for me, it, yeah, it did just seem logical to, to look at things in a certain way. So yeah, so off the back of that, I would say that probably most companies are doing a pretty shit job of it. Um, there are companies I know um, in all sorts of industries who go to trade shows. I was talking to one company who go to, there's one in a big industry trade show in Vegas, which takes place every two or three years. And then another mm. one in Germany. It, it's in sort of more manufacturing, industrial type processes. And yeah. they spend somewhere in the region of half to three quarters of a million quid just to take the space and to get the people out there. Yeah. And, you know, this is a big big investment right for, it's for a huge company investment. Of their size, right absolutely and one of the one of the questions i had with them I said so w- talk me through what you do about this event and i got a lot of logistics stuff about how they ship the thing out there and how they put this thing there in the deal mm. i was like yeah, but what do you do before to kind of yeah. make sure that you're talking to people on the day you're not just hoping somebody useful walks past <laughs> and there's a lot of blank looks coming my way yeah, okay and then I was like, and, and then at the show, what do you do? Got lots of information. And then what do you do after the show? And it's like, oh, geez, well, they, everyone takes leave because they're tired. And then you've got to de-rig. And <laughs> you've got to do that. And they go, brilliant. And then we've got another show that comes up in six weeks time, which is somewhere else. It's a bit smaller. So we go to that. And you're mm. like, so you don't follow any of the leads? Oh, no, like like the sales team will have like two or three key leads. They'll follow up. How many people do you speak to? Like 300. Mm. What do you do with the other 286 people? Yeah. And you're like, right. I think we've got some work to do here. So uh, that, that's a, quite a long introduction to this. But is that what you found? Because everywhere I go to talk trade shows, I find exactly the same problem. Yeah. I mean, I I haven't spoken to a huge amount of companies about their process, but I think even internally, that that was the thing that confused me is that I remember these guys, they've gone to a show in Dubai. So you can imagine how expensive that was just mm-hmm. to send them. We didn't even have a, a space at that point, but we, you know, they went and they came back, I think, with like uh, definitely over 100 cards each and then just let those cards kind of sit on their desks. And so, you know, I asked, I was like, oh, have we been to this show before? I mean, given that we were, I mean, I would, I've would, i described it as a start. I'd say late stage start at kind of like the scale up point. So it, it made sense that maybe we hadn't been to a huge amount of shows before, but we were spending money. That again, was it a sales budget? Was it a marketing budget? Um, a lot of the time when it didn't when things didn't work out, it fell onto marketing. Yes. If it did, then it went straight to sales. And so yes. <laughs> it was about kind of finding that differentiation. It was about, okay, a month later, where are we at? Six months later, where are we at? Because as well, we were I was in a company where actually it was quite a long sales cycle. So it was a thing like, yes, follow up on your hot leads within within the week, within two weeks. But things do take time and it's entirely possible that actually six months down the line we're gonna see a lead generated from an event that happened six months ago. And we need to make sure that we track that and we need to make sure that we're keeping a record of that somewhere so that we can send some more people there. Or maybe we just send one person rather than two. And it was all those kind of questions that naturally came up that no one in the company really had an answer for. And so I was like, let me make a spreadsheet. <laughs> and, uh, and that's where I already started. But yeah, it is it's definitely something that has come up. And we actually, at one point, we workshopped with another B2B that, that was based out here in Barcelona. And we were comparing kind of how we do things within marketing mm-hmm. and with the events. And I would definitely, the main event isn't actually the, the most important part by a mile. Like the prep, I think, is definitely where it's really, really key. Because I think events are a place where you kind of, you can make things happen where you can kind of take it to the next step. Ideally, by the time you've, you're meeting someone at an event, you've already introduced yourself to them. They already have an idea of what you're proposing. And essentially at the event, you're solidifying on that conversation and you're building towards the next step. 
people don't have time at events like a lot of the time your meetings are like 15 minutes really 30 minutes if you're really lucky and so the main thing that you want to do at that event is say acknowledge the fact that like hey yes I am interested and hey let's put something in the diary for the upcoming month of this is what we'll discuss and this is what we'll talk about yeah so amazingly prepare for something do the event prepare for what you're going to do afterwards yeah seems like really good advice for mm. not just for events generally for life I suppose, it. Isn't yeah. it? Like, prepare you for think. stuff and be ready <laughs> for it just, i don't know it's, it's just I, it amazes me genuinely amazes me the investment companies put into going to events yeah and don't match the financial investment with the time investment other than boots on the ground in a couple of days of mm. the event and it just for sure i really don't for sure. yeah 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 definitely so were you at that time were you demand generation is that what your job title was, not just yeah job? actually that came a lot well that came about like four years into to my time there so I was events yeah I was mainly focused on events at one point obviously COVID happened so that felt a bit of a a, a dangerous time to be an event manager but essentially mm-hmm. we pivoted online and webinars became my bag and <laughs> I became really good at webinars um it was a really lot. quickly as well isn't it it's like i've never done a webinar before i'm an expert at webinars. yes <laughs> exactly we were at one point we were doing about three to four webinars a week and we were niching per industry and it was all very intense and i was kind of the webinar host so i had to become a specialist in a lot of areas really quickly you know to ask some good questions you know um but so that happened and then we actually we had a change of management and um the, our new kind of head of marketing really wanted to push essentially our marketing team to the next level um and noticed that so our sales team were divided by um geographic location mm-hmm. and but marketing was kind of was divided by kind of the specialisms within marketing and so sometimes there was a bit of a clash in that of like what marketing resources were going where some markets felt a bit abandoned by the marketing team or didn't feel like they had enough attention on them um and it made sense that we applied different marketing strategies according to the market that we were working with so essentially the demand generation manager became a combination of doing the digital and like the offline bits for a specific market. So I was tasked with like UK and the DAC market. And so I had to look at both things like events, but also what are we doing online, digital Mm -hmm. marketing wise, what are we doing PR wise, just the whole marketing suite essentially, Um, which actually served me really well, given that my next job after that was head of marketing, which essentially then made me become a generalist, which I hadn't really done before. So having those like six months of demand generation was very helpful towards that. And yeah, and it was a role that was completely catered to bringing in leads. Like that was the goal. That was the idea. Like anything that is outside of lead generation was not my responsibility. Right. So my my regular listeners will know I love to have a rant about shit marketing titles and demand generation <laughs> manager feels right up there. But maybe I'm going to kind of ease back a little bit on this because maybe if it is just... It's, so were you looking at... And maybe there's a bit of B2B sales process that you can talk mm. about here in terms of you know, handing over marketing qualified leads to sales. Is that basically what you were doing? Yeah, pretty much. I think it was really looking at the leads that marketing was bringing in and then how could we really support our sales teams in in converting them? So is there a point in sending every lead our way to the sales team? A lot of the time, no. So it was about differentiating, classifying those leads. The hot ones, they're going straight to sales. And we had different benchmarks to kind of qualify what a hot lead Mm -hmm. looked like, maybe a specific piece of content or a specific CTA that was triggered. And then otherwise, it's what can marketing do to kind of warm up that lead and prep it so that it gets to a place where we can then pass it on. And I do think it was something that was necessary. I'm not going to lie, when that title was first kind of like, proposed to me I was a bit like I don't know how I feel about this like I'm really unsure I think a lot of it as well was this idea 
we didn't really know internally how we were going to be able to make the switch because all of us had niched so much. We obviously were going to be the experts in whatever specialism we'd been working on for the last few years. Mm -hmm. So then it was about kind of teaching other people in the team how to kind of, you know, onboarding them into the events process, understanding what it meant and just kind of passing on that information. But then, yeah, at the same time, it was really valuable because it did make us better marketers because we we had a much better understanding of what was happening behind the scenes for like our website for example or the email mm. marketing and etc and it is a well well trodden path as people develop in marketing they often start mm. in some sort of specialism and as you get a little bit older um i'm not calling you old but just as you get older <laughs> you sometimes see maybe the limitations of what you were doing um i mean i had the same when i was a digital marketer and i was like this just doesn't answer all the questions that i have and it, it answers some of them but not all of them and then you start looking wider and broadening and broadening and broadening your skill set so it sounds like you kind of gone on that journey and maybe it was forced on you a little bit but do you feel better as a better marketer now that you've got that broader world view I think so definitely I think also with that company I think sales had a huge impact on what marketing was doing like sales drove a lot of what we were doing and I think the, that new head of marketing kind of came in and said like marketing is a discipline within itself like we are experts like we shouldn't purely be influenced on what sales people are saying telling us to marketing do is like not a sales you, support function but it like do you know what I mean sales. like it is that thing right or where, like a salesperson just like kind of hands off something because they're like obviously this is easy like almost like marketing isn't like a skill or a, a thing within itself you know yeah. And so I think it also, it gave us the sense of ownership of working, still working really closely with our sales team. We would work with like the sales team leader on different initiatives. We would understand what's working in certain markets. Cold calling was like a gold mine and that was the way it should really be approached. Some other markets, namely actually the UK, cold calling is hard, like mm -hmm. hardcore. Um, and so then it was about trying to be a bit creative in kind of how we could bring about different leads and things like that. So it was it was a really interesting role because it allowed me to understand sales a lot better as well and kind of their thoughts, their concerns as well and like how how maybe we could kind of alleviate those. And yeah, it definitely did make me a better marketer and I definitely wouldn't be able to do the role that I'm, I mean, I probably would, but just maybe not as well do the role that I'm doing now because it did give me a much better idea of what works what doesn't work as well and the practice of it as bit as well like the actual it's not only just having an awareness but it's actually putting things into practice and testing these things so I, I'm a big believer that everyone in marketing should at least once do a job that is really tightly connected to sales. Mm. And sometimes when you see big enterprise consumer companies where they have so many people in marketing doing small fractions, performance marketers, yeah, they, they can see that link between sales. But a lot of the time it can be hard to measure for some marketers. And that often leads to a lot of marketers not wanting to talk about finance and selling stuff and numbers at yeah. the end, you know, pound signs at the end or euro signs. And actually, you've got to get comfortable with the fact that what our job is, is the same as sales. We approach it differently. But if the company's yeah. not selling stuff, we're all going to be out of a job, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to get comfortable with how does what we do affect sales? That could be Absolutely. number of leads generated, not necessarily number of things sold, but we've got to get comfy with it. So it gives you that real corporate commercial approach to it, doesn't it? Which is, is always going to stand you in good stead for the future. Definitely. And you have a much stronger buy-in as well. You have a larger sense of responsibility towards the bigger picture of it all because as well as, I mean, as much as our, well, my final role was really focused on demand generation, there was also the point of like, let's look at your sales cycle. What point in the sales cycle are we struggling with? Is there a part where we're not converting as well? What can marketing do to kind of jump in? Can we maybe provide an additional webinar or workshop or like can we invite people to events for example <laughs> like that was always like a really strong one like you know you'd get a salesperson saying I'm finding it really hard to close this this deal and I would be able to say hey I know that they're attending this event have a meeting with them at that event just get the conversation going again and a lot of the time 
that that is sometimes how we used events and it didn't necessarily then contribute to like my lead generation goal mm -hmm. but at the end of the day it was about kind of closing and and we were able to support with that too there is uh, every company in the world that has a marketing team that feeds leads into sales or marketing qualified leads, whatever, um, is looking at their process going, we hand this lead over either too late or too soon. And mm. we'll be spending a fortune and loads of time trying to change where they move that point to somewhere else that's going to be better. And then in a year's time, look at that and go, no, we need to move that point again. There is no perfect point, is there? But it sounds no. just about working the way through to understand that. For sure. And it's important to keep following your lead once you've passed it on. I think that was something that we really learned. And that was also something that was maybe a bit of a like a point of contention within within that company sometimes is that sales sometimes would prioritize their own leads because they get a bit, not a better commission because they get the commission regardless. But according to their own individual goals it's a lot stronger for them to close their own lead that they cold called than one that marketing's passed over so it was actually right. really important that we follow our leads too and that we put pressure on sales to, to work on those as well so that you know we could kind of look at the bigger picture and say hey marketing is contributing because there was that danger of saying like oh marketing is is giving us shitty leads when actually that really wasn't the point it was they're just not moving through the sales cycle. When you talk about marketing in these terms, it's very commercially focused. It's about yes. driving lead generation, ultimately following that through to euros, dollars, pounds, landing in the company's coffers, right? Yes. How does that make you feel when you see marketers uh, or hear other people talk about marketing as the color in department or we are just the, you know, you do these great posters or isn't this lovely and marketing doesn't, what reaction do you get when you hear that? <laughs> Slightly furious, uh, frustrating. I think I'm it's smiling really when you're furious. Then go for, <laughs> go for it. Go for it. I'm mad. Um, no, uh, I I find it very frustrating because I think, yeah, people do pass off marketing as this silly little task that's almost like this B task compared to maybe what more commercial teams are doing. Um, when in fact marketing is very much part of that commercial team and, and, and is an extension of it. And let's be honest, without marketing, your commercials are going to shit. Like nothing is really happening. It's obviously here we've been talking a lot about lead generation and like hard numbers. But, you know, you can look at the other side of things. If we're talking brand visibility, if we're talking authority within your industry, these are all things led by marketing. And the only reason why people will trust your company and will trust the things that you say is because marketing has played a part in that. Your website, who's doing that? That's your marketing team. Like, like everything, all of those elements, and it's a lot of elements, I think, as well. I think that's the part I think people fail to understand about marketing is that it's such a wide ranging discipline that maybe that's why maybe people don't quite fully understand what we're doing because there are so many little different touch points and when you do break it down like for example if I if I'm giving like my weekly goals to the team it does feel like these little tasks and maybe that we're not as good at, sh at explaining the bigger picture and why we're doing certain mm. things but it is part of this discourse of like it's a long-term game and like even if we can't put a, a number to some of the things that we do we do know like a salesperson if you're cold calling the first thing that person is going to do is look at your website it's, they're going to look maybe at your linkedin page or they're, they're going to look at your activity if maybe we, you know they go to a linkedin page and they see nothing's happened in the past year why why am I trusting your company why am I giving you my money if I see that they're engaging with other industry experts with other if other people are commending us that all does come from marketing you know and so I think that's why I get frustrated with it because yeah these things are less tangible but they count they really it, do but count. is that a marketing problem is this marketers who are happy with the fun stuff the coloring in department and just happy with those not superficial because they're important yeah. but that 
it, it is. There's a lot of fluff goes on in a lot of marketing teams, and I love it because sure. the only reason I have a job because I didn't go and have to go and fix all that shit that they've got wrong. But yeah, it's a marketing problem, isn't it? It's not the rest of the world doesn't understand us. It's a lot of the people in the discipline don't understand us. Mm. Therefore, we can't tell that story to the rest of the world. Yeah, and I think I do also think it leans into this idea of like creatives not being as serious. There's obviously elements of creativity that goes into marketing, and I think. It's almost like this wider society thing where, you know, you talk about STEM and, you know, that's authority. It's, you know, it's serious. It's good stuff. Like even like you, you're to talk to your parents about certain things and they're going to put a lot more respect if, you know, you say, hey, mom, I'm going to be a doctor mm-hmm. versus I'm going to do marketing. Um, so, I still remember I, my granny being so disappointed when I told her I wasn't going to become a teacher, which is what I went to uni to do. Mm. She was like, well why wouldn't you become a teacher? I was like, it just doesn't interest me, but it's a good job. You're like, I don't care. I don't, yeah. I'm not interested. Yeah. And there's almost this element of like, if you get joy and enjoyment from your job, it's not that serious a thing or like not that skilled a thing either. Um, And so I think that there are those kind of elements that creep into it too. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I think as well, and it's a, a strange not a strange one but it's just a quick handbrake term which might lead us somewhere else is that mm. being from a, a family of a migrant community so my granny was part of the Windrush generation that came over from uh, the Caribbean to the UK and came over doing let's be honest not particularly great jobs right she was a cleaner for a while mm. um, most of her life actually she she cleaned places took shitty jobs in places got moved on because people didn't like her for the color of her skin and all that sort of yeah the joys of being um from the Caribbean in the UK in the 50s and 60s, right? <laughs> so when your grandson comes and says he wants to be a teacher, teachers have a respect. Professions yes. have a respect that, uh, uh, you know, she just never could have had as a child, uh, as a grow- an adult even in the UK, because that she that was a respect no one ever conferred on her. So you, you're going to be a teacher, you're going to be an accountant, you're going to be a doctor. Wonderful. We've achieved respectability in this community, in this place. And then you Absolutely. go, no, I'm going into marketing, Granny. And she's like, what? <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I also, a lot of my family, funnily enough, are either kind of like creatives or haven't really been in corporate. My mum is a teacher, actually. Um, and my dad is an engineer for TFL. Um, and so I think that was also part of why I wanted to study management at uni, because I didn't really have anyone within my family really my grandpa did have a bit of a corporate job and he loves to talk about the good old days like you kind of get him started and he just can't stop but we're obviously what living in a very different world to the one mm. that my grandpa was was working in um and so I I really didn't know what it looked like like office culture or corporate or anything like that like I remember the first day of my internship being like what is a product manager like genuinely what does that mean and especially when it's not a tangible product like something that you can hold in your hand like this was a software like technically was it was fintech SaaS, and so it was this conceptual thing that we were talking about and I, I I just I didn't understand how people spent their days like I was one of those people like even within the marketing team when someone was like yeah I do data I was what what does that mean? What are you looking at? Like, why is that interesting? And what does that bring around? And so I'm glad I did come into it with so much curiosity, because then it did mean that I I learned to like, really respect the work that people were doing. And obviously, and quite luckily, being part of this internal team, a lot of us were quite young, I think, the average age of the of the of employees in that company when I joined was maybe like 29 something like that so it was a really young company so it was a really great place to be a part of because those of us that were there for maybe longer than like your typical two-year cycle we really grew up together and so we grew up through the ranks as well like by the end the people that I had started with we were all managers within the marketing team and leading our own strategies and budget holders and things like that and that part was really fantastic but yeah, explaining it to someone on the outside can sometimes be really difficult. Like, yeah, it, I did spend all my morning spent sending emails. Like, <laughs> how do I, you know, yeah. quantify how does this that? Look like a that proper is a job. thing. Yeah. 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 And, and you, meant, you mentioned about not knowing what some of these things mean. And I think there is a whole, 
gap, depending on maybe where you went to school before you even get to university. Or Absolutely. Jobs that you just don't understand. Have no idea about. Have no idea about. And um, uh, and yeah, sorry, that I, was... No I'm, I'm a non-exec director in a couple of places, right? And I don't think... I think I was about 28 before someone actually sent me and said, do you know what an NED actually is? I was like, no, I, I mean, I've seen this NED term around, but what is it? You know, and like, I, if I'd have gone to a different school, probably a fee-paying school, you probably get trained for that, maybe at GCSE. I don't know. I didn't go there. But I didn't know what it meant. Yeah. There's just a whole world of stuff you just don't understand that no one ever explains to you. For sure, for sure. And actually... I will say that is one of the things that I really took out of uni. Like uni, it wasn't necessarily, I still think actually at uni, they did a terrible job of explaining the possibilities of like what I could do with my degree. Like I think that unis have a lot, should have a lot more responsibility mm -hmm. to that regard. But what I did come out with was a network. And so with things like LinkedIn and you see people updating their job descriptions or the companies that they're working for, I would always just look those things up. Or I would look up these companies, like what are they doing? Like, like could I work there? What would I need to do to be able to work there? And that was something that was really useful to me. And having that network and people understanding your skill set and then maybe presenting you or putting you forward for certain opportunities, I think was invaluable and has been invaluable. Yeah. And you've also taken some steps to help other people who've been through a similar uh, approach or similar press. So tell us about mm -hmm. a bold talk. What's that all about? Yeah, sure. So a bold talk was a bit of a passion project that I started with a good friend called Paulina Lanyo. Look her up. She's brilliant. I honestly, I love her. I admire her. I think she's brilliant. Um, And so we were both working for the same company. And we, Paulina actually is the person who, who brought the idea to me. She, she knew that I kind of have these ambitions and have this curiosity as well. And I also was quite an outspoken person in in the workplace about opportunities about gender about all of these kind of different workplace kind of culture topics and we did we kind of got to a point where we'd started our careers so you know we'd done the internship we'd had all of this support and this quite clear path that was laid out for us um but then we'd got to a point where we kind of it's not even a mid-management level but almost that kind of level where maybe we weren't sure if we wanted to stay within the discipline we weren't we weren't sure how to take the next step and when we spoke about that with you know with friends we we put a survey out there as well a lot of people felt that way and namely women like mm -hmm. that was that was something that we really found is that women found it really hard to champion themselves in the in the workplace to really understand their value I mean, we can talk about imposter syndrome, like until until you know forever. But there were like there were like just just these different things that we found a lot of our friends were also kind of going through. And the easiest thing to do when you're stuck is to talk about it and to be open and honest about it. And so we decided to create this community called A Bold Talk. Um, it lasted a couple of months, and in the end, like we didn't carry on with it just because life kind of got in the way and mm -hmm. but it was really enjoyable we did like monthly workshops um where we would touch on different subjects like the first one was literally about understanding your value and just breaking it down in such a logical way that no one can really argue we'd found that you know sometimes when we approached managers about salary raises or promotions those conversations are challenging and uncomfortable at the best of times. And I think if you don't go into those conversations with confidence and with this awareness of kind of who you are and where you want to go, you can really easily either kind of be manipulated or maybe told just the right phrase to almost keep you quiet, to not bring it up again. And so we we kind of wanted to fight that a little bit and go against that and say, hey, like we're actually really valuable people within the company. I don't want to say mm -hmm. assets because that just is a bit non- A bit more than that. Yeah. But, you know, like we're people, we bring value. And if we leave, you guys, you're not actually going to like really struggle to find someone else, but you will understand the value that we brought. And it would be a, a sad place to get to that point. Um, 
and not have anything that happened kind of before. So yes, that was one. We talked about imposter syndrome as well in another one. And it was really interesting because there's this article actually, I think that kind of went a little bit viral um, that was published in the Harvard Business Review. And it was called Stop Telling Women That They've Got Imposter Syndrome. And essentially the author of that article was positioning it in the fact that workplaces have been developed typically for men, it's corporate, we're talking corporate here. Um, they've been developed with men in mind, um, with how they work, with how they function, with you know their how competitive they are. Like there's lots of different attributes that we can kind of differentiate between between the genders. And women just don't naturally sometimes have a place in it or are as comfortable working the system in that same way. Like we tend to kind of have the approach of like, if I do a good job, good things will kind of come to me. We've That's what we've always been taught, right? Like you do this thing well, you will be rewarded for your good behavior. Um, whereas men are a lot, tend to be, I, I know I'm making a lot of generalizations here, but tend to be a bit more proactive. They kind of like the competition kind of aspect of things and they will put themselves forwards and they have the audacity. Like a lot, like we see it, like even at the beginning of careers, like men will go in and negotiate their salary from the get go. Whereas women will be like, oh, thank you for giving me this salary. I'll prove my worth and then I'll come to you. And so already we're on, we're not on an equal playing field. And so what this author was saying in this article was actually men, women are entering the workplace and are as ambitious at the beginning as men, but all of this, the system essentially kind of means that they can't navigate it as easily or as well. And it's just not really made for us. I, I'm saying that with inverted commas for people that aren't watching, but and don't worry about the about the generalizations. We're going to click this up and make you sound like a horrific um, <laughs> man hating misogynist. Don't worry about that. That's fine. You got that sorted. Yeah, but it like that's kind of and actually having that point of view of knowing like actually it's not an individual problem. It's not me not being confident enough, or it's not me not shouting enough about my achievements because that was also something that. I found really frustrating when I would speak to managers there would like they would tell me like oh maybe you just need to be a bit more serious what why are you telling me to be more serious because I smile like that was genuinely a comment that was made to me for me to be able to move up in the workplace like that is insane to me like all because I am agreeable because I, I do I'm a positive person in general like that isn't a negative trait and that isn't a bad thing and it's not something that I should be adapting for the workplace if anything it's an asset and so it's about understanding that the system wasn't built for us um very much like we see it with with ethnic minorities also entering the workplace or anyone with any kind of like almost like protected characteristic the the workplace is made for straight white men like that's what it's really been built for so when the further you are away from that the harder it's going to be to really progress in those places and I've, I've really rambled on about it but that's kind of what that article was saying is like we don't have imposter syndrome workplaces need to change to adapt to how we work best if I thought you were rambling, I would have interrupted and moved on to a different <laughs> subject. It, it was great to listen to, so please don't apologize. Um, every time you look at research around the workplace about um, ethnic minorities and women are probably the two areas I've looked at the most, um, but the, the similar studies of um, CVs or resumes for the American listeners being submitted, one with a really obvious ethnic minority name, one with a very obvious uh, white British name, exactly yeah. the same CV, uh, which one gets shortlisted? It's the white guy all the time. You do the same yeah. same thing, but with women, who gets shortlisted? The men all the time as well. Um, not Absolutely. all the time, but percentage-wise, when you do it at scale, it, it's a huge difference that you see. So you, you, this is something that's important in the workplace, that people are talking about this and are trying to make a difference and make a change, Absolutely. which probably brings us to what your work not your work at viaduct generation the whole ethos of vg so tell mm. us you said the mission led and about raising uh, awareness of um sort of underrepresented groups but how yeah. does that work and let's be honest how does that work 
alongside making money? Because if a business doesn't make money, it's either a charity or it's not going to be a business for very long. So how do those mm. two things work together? Sure. So a quick kind of background for VG, because I think it helps it make sense as to why we're mission led. Our CEO, Fabio Mbalo, used to work for a large SEO platform. And in the wake of George uh, Floyd's murder in 2020, he kind of, I think, with along with a lot of black people in the workplace, were a bit like, something something needs to change here like something needs to happen I think we were all affected in the workplace and mm -hmm. and wanted to kind of contribute towards the cause and something that had bothered Fabio in his career he was he was traditionally kind of like a, a CSM for for search platforms is that in a lot of the clients that he dealt with none of them were black like none of them and, and he'd been in it for like at least five years and he he was like that doesn't make sense to me that I'm really and he was working for global companies as well so he was like that I mean you see them a lot more maybe in the states but otherwise in general he just really didn't see them so he he did he carried out some research and in July 2020 when he looked at the top so his specialism obviously is SEO <laughs> gotta put that one in there um, so he looked at top kind of ranking companies in the UK. He looked at 10 different industries and he looked at the 100 top ranking companies in those industries. Only two of those companies, so two out of 1,000, were black owned, which is insane if you look at the proportion of black people in the UK. And even if About you dig it down to like, it, like that in the UK. Yeah, but even if you like look down and dig down into kind of like the proportion of like black entrepreneurs, it still doesn't make sense that so few are, are ranking. And so he saw this gap where he was like, black founders or companies run by black founders are not getting the same opportunities and access to things like software, to things like advice or expertise um, as perhaps like their white counterparts. Um, and so that's essentially how Viaduct Generation came about. It was, I want to tackle this problem. Um, and so, yeah, so that was kind of our ethos. From there, we developed two underrepresented founders because we did find, if we're talking from a commercial perspective, a lot of the companies that we were reaching out to unfortunately they just didn't have the budget like we kind of had an idea that that was the case and also when you're talking about a discipline like SEO where you're asking really people to invest about 12 months of money up front without guaranteed results it's it's a big risk if already it's like you TV advertising a, but a worse deal it's not cheap you know and so we had found a way to make it cheaper but it was still quite inaccessible and so from a commercial standpoint for us to survive as a business survive as a bootstrapped business um that made it a lot more difficult so we really wanted to extend that and also it makes sense that you know if our ethos is to help those kind of founders that usually don't get a look in let's just spread that to the different communities as well um and also it means that we can stay a lot truer to our mission like obviously we lead with the fact that we're mission led. So then we get asked about our stats and it doesn't look great if we actually can't stack them up. But yeah, in the commercialization, we also saw that we, at one point we weren't making enough money. Um, and that was kind of the hard truth of it. And so we said, hey, let's open up our client roster with this idea that we feed money back in. And so we can then provide either like free workshops, resources, partner with other organizations that are targeting these communities and really help people get at least their first steps into it. Because sometimes people, it's it's like quite, I don't, I don't even know if it's five pronged, how many prongs there are, but there's quite a different, like a few different ways to approach it. There's one, the issue of education. Some people just don't know enough about it. They don't understand the complexities of it. And, you know, it being, we call it a fairly new discipline. I think digital marketing in general, we can kind of put in that boat, right? Um, people think maybe if I just like do it once, it's enough. I don't have to be that consistent with it. Or, you know, I saw this video on YouTube and that will help me. And yeah, sure, that will maybe get your first kind of step, your foot in the door. But 
with such a rapidly progressive and evolving discipline it is really important to have experts that can be like hey I've heard about this new Google update and it's really important that we we update our website accordingly um so there's that as well people just have not having that awareness budget is is kind of like Mm -hmm. one of the biggest reasons they don't have enough money and that roots back to like black businesses not getting funding like we can look at those stats as well like compared to their counterparts black businesses are not getting nearly as much money which means they cannot afford the resources the tools the teams that other people can and so essentially that gap just keeps getting bigger um which is a little bit depressing when you when you look at it but we kind of want to be there and say hey we really want to support you in that so yeah so we do things like free workshops we do things like mentorship we attend specific events that are targeting those communities where we really try and we we try and diversify as well the services that we offer we really try to be as flexible as we can to cater to these companies and to make it work and then I think also another thing that we've really taken upon ourselves is to shout out about it in the industry. Like we're not the the biggest company. We're not the richest company by any means. But if we can maybe get other agencies in the industry to be aware of the problem, maybe they can do a bit of the reach out. Maybe they can provide a few of their sort of services or, you know, give discounts on their products or softwares and things like that. So, yeah, that's kind of how we've we've approached it so far. In terms of making some noise, uh, Fabio and I are going to be on stage at Brighton SEO in, is it March or April 23? I can't is remember. Is this an it's exclusive? Be. Exclusive reveal. Um, <laughs> Fabio, myself, and Azim. Um, Azim's last name is Digital Asks. I think if you know that. Um, <laughs> so myself, Fabio, and Azim. <laughs> and we've got three presentations, but we're, we're kind of on in the same slot and we're going to kind of talk about strategy and tactics. I and mean, it's kind of all been stitched together around yeah. this sort of theme as well so um it's a bit early it, it's november when we're recording this and this isn't happening until march or april so i haven't even planned and prepped anything yet but we know roughly what we're <laughs> going to be doing that's okay <laughs> but it's about it's about raising awareness and and sharing knowledge and, and kind of putting all these things together so i think it's a really interesting approach that that um that viaduct generation take and i also like mm. the fact that it, it's it, survive the rea- the commercial reality of running an agency right is that sometimes you do have to go is this a compromise is it no mm. it's not actually it's a way to help fund doing what we want to do in our mission because we look that whether you doesn't matter whether you're a capitalist or not right if you don't have money you can't you've got to eat while you yeah doing it. And that's just yeah that you've got to be it. realistic about it and it was something you know we spoke to enough black businesses as well or black business owners where you know they would be so interested and they're so into it. And then you get to the conversation on price and, you know, we're trying to take it as far as we can, but at the same time, you know, we're in, we're an agency with 15 people like on full-time salaries that we're trying to pay a decent wage as well. You know, that we don't want to compromise too much from our side because, you know, we do kind of preach the diversity and quality Mm -hmm. inclusion ethos and it's important that as much as we preach it externally and provide something to our clients it's important that we're able to kind of reflect that internally and to and that was I think also another part of VG that when Fabio first presented the idea that I really loved is that we also make a point of maybe giving opportunities to people that wouldn't typically kind of get a foot in when it comes to marketing I think marketing is a hard industry to break into especially these days where you do have like for example, like you see platforms on LinkedIn where you where people will kind of like upload the portfolio of what they've done and they're at uni and they've never worked for anyone, but they've kind of taken it upon. They've just they've discovered that marketing is their passion, which is brilliant. I'm really happy for them. But not everyone gets that that privilege, essentially, mm-hmm. of knowing what your passion is. A lot of us kind of have to work our way through and find our way and it's a lot of trial and error but trial and error is an expensive thing to engage in um and if you don't have that kind of safety blanket like the internship that I did I speak about that a lot I was getting paid not enough like it was not covering my rent kind of thing and I knew that going in and I specifically had savings for that reason like I saved up money to be able to do an internship to get in and like 
that's already still coming from a place of privilege from my end. So for someone who really has no idea, who actually could be really skilled or really creative and have all of these things, but they don't, you know, then they they still they need to earn money or they they don't have the time they can't give the time that others would because you know they've looked at a company they've created a case study or they've done something super creative and you know they've made an incredible resume and all of these things not everyone is afforded that luxury and so it was important for us to to cater to those mm -hmm. people so you know we we've had quite a few apprentices come through um come through VG we've hired a lot of people that don't have degrees for example or who don't have something specific marketing experience previously and we're really taking it taking them in on their willingness to learn on the skills that they can show us that they already have that they're willing to develop because and I truly believe it kind of applies to a lot of jobs I mean obviously maybe the, the higher you go in terms of seniority you can't just you know apply to any odd job but a lot of jobs it's the skills that you bring to it and then you get all your training if it's if it's a good company that has a good onboarding practice you are being taught everything you need to know in hopefully the first two weeks month that you join a company so really it's about how do I apply the skills that I've learned previously that I've picked up previously that doesn't necessarily have to come from an academic background or specific marketing experience and how do I apply it to the situation that I'm in now? And that was something that was also really important to us. Yeah. And look, curiosity is a big thing as well, isn't it? You mentioned mm, that you had absolutely. that. Being able to and wanting to learn new things is is something that's really important. I think when you when you're certainly entering the workplace, that desire to learn more things and add more strings to your bow as you go. Because you don't yeah. always know what, what you're after as soon as you walk into absolutely. a door. Do so, yeah, yeah so, for sure. So I've blown way over the time limit and realized that you might even be late for another meeting. So apologies for that. But I've got a couple of wrap-up questions that I ask everyone. So yeah. where, other than listening to this wonderful podcast, what, where else do you go for your information to stay on top of the marketing industry? Are you a book reader? Are you a blog reader? Are you a podcast listener? Do you do all of those? What would you recommend? I would say LinkedIn is probably my biggest resource. I've learned the most of LinkedIn. I'd say Twitter is quite a good one but I kind of really have this thing between work-life balance that is part of the reason why I live in Barcelona like I, I saw what London was I understood that you kind of give up your life and soul if you're trying to make a career in London and it was just not something I wanted to be a part of and in Spain they appreciate work-life balance so um I try like things that I use for fun. So I do use Twitter on a more personal basis. Mm -hmm. And I try not to get too involved on a professional basis. So that's why I like LinkedIn, because LinkedIn is really like my professional dashboard. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'd, I'd say definitely that. Um, and certain communities like the marketing meetup, I think, is a gem, like a real, real gem. It's I when I was like really doing lots of webinars. I was just so impressed by the engagement that they get in that in in those webinars and in those workshops and mm -hmm. the people that come on and the conversations that happen and networking that happens behind the scenes. Like I think that part is great. Given that I'm from an event background, I love to preach an event. <laughs> um, I think events are really valuable because I also think given that we are in a very digital world, I'm not great at actually absorbing information from a computer like reading something on my laptop I don't absorb half as much as the information as I would if I'm actually having a conversation with someone mm -hmm. um and I would love to say books but honestly I don't even have enough time to personally read like I've got a really impressive bookshelf with lots of really lovely books that are just, just gathering the ones to impress dust. anyone who comes down <laughs> the apartment haven't you it's like look at all these books that I've never read yeah yeah no exactly so yeah so i think i think those are kind of like my main resources i would say cool no no good result i did uh the marketing meetup in manchester um yeah, presented there really good, good good events really well put together so no, i like that um so my For last sure. question then before i let you go and get back to your day what one question do you usually get asked on podcasts that i haven't asked you today 
You know what? You're the first podcast I've come on to. So really? oh, <laughs> you should do more of these. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm usually on the other side, so I don't, I don't, I don't know that I have an actual answer to that question. Is that disappointing? Hugely so. Hugely so. <laughs> well, that's all right. It doesn't matter. You're going now, so you don't have to worry about it. You've ruined my day. Thank you very much. Uh, Noemi, thank you for your time. It's been brilliant. Your details of LinkedIn are in the show notes. So if anybody wants to contact and get in touch, please do. Um, but thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great.